And welcome to High School Physics Explained. Today I'm going to talk about relaxation. If you watched my previous video, I talked about resonance and I spoke to you about two factors that lead to a higher energy state of our hydrogen nuclei. Number one, we have spin flip where you get more parallel alignment going to anti-parallel alignment. And secondly, the processing hydrogen atoms start to go in phase. The net result is that initially you of course have a net magnetization vector that is in the vertical position leading to a transverse magnetization vector going in the horizontal direction and so we say that that magnetization vector has been knocked down and that in essence is resonance so we're going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state yeah. and obviously the hydrogen nuclei have absorbed energy and that's really important as we continue on. So what happens when this radio pulse is switched off? Well, this is what relaxation is all about. In simple terms, what is happening is it returns back to its old state. Firstly, we have the net magnetization vector due to the spin down options, the anti-parallel options, going less to the lower energy state. And so we have less going down. And secondly, we have the precession going from in phase to out of phase. And so what happens is we go from a high energy state to a low energy state. So the energy l drops. Now, law of conservation of energy says you don't lose energy. It is transformed in other forms. And so what happens is as this goes from there to there, we end up getting energy being released. And that energy is in the form of radio waves, which are then picked up by these coils. And so in essence, it's one set of coils that causes the hydrogen atoms to go into a higher energy state, that is resonance, but as they relax and they return back to normal with the net magnetization going from a horizontal position to a vertical position like so, we have a loss of energy. And that in essence is what relaxation is all about, picking up this energy. So how does that produce an image? Here is an MRI of a slice of the brain and you can see that the image is black and white and what is shown here in essence is the strength of the signal received by the MRI machine based on the density of hydrogen atoms. Now the brain is made up of a whole bunch of things. It's made up of bone, it's made up of water, it's made up of fat and obviously a number of other things. But if you want to concentrate solely today on these three factors, we'll explain why they appear different shades of grey. So this image is called a proton density image. So it's specifically just measuring the strength of the signal received, the radio signal received, by the density of the hydrogen atoms received. So let's deal with first with fat. Now fat is very high in hydrogen. And so as a result, because it's more dense in hydrogen, you're going to get more radio frequencies from this, these areas. So areas such as this is white because there's a high proportion of fat in those tissues. Clearly areas such as here and here also is relatively high in fat. And we know that the structure of the brain is predominantly based on two types of cells and they are the actual neurons, uh, which we often refer to as gray matter and the support cells, which uh, provide a whole bunch of things, but ultimately we often call that as the white matter. And it's white because those cells are filled with fat. And so you can see there's a lot of lighter material around the tissue. If you look at this space over here, this is filled with predominantly water. Why? Because your brain is bathed in a liquid called cerebral spinal fluid, and it is particularly just water, plus a few other things, but we won't discuss that right now. Water has a lower density than fat in terms of hydrogen atoms. So therefore you're going to get a darker signal over here. Bone similarly is very dark. The proportion of hydrogen atoms, at least when compared to fat, is a lot lower. So bone appears fairly dark in the tissue type. 
If you then look at the edge here, this is white again. Well, that can be explained by the fact that your scalp is covered by a layer of skin, which has some subcutaneous fat. Well, there you go. There's the fat again. And therefore, you have a higher proportion of hydrogen atoms, whereas these, of course, have a low proportion of hydrogen atoms. And in essence, that is what we're getting. But let's now concentrate on two aspects of the relaxation. And relaxation can be really divided up into two types. If you remember, I talked about the fact that there are two aspects that change when hydrogen atoms relax. And the first one, of course, is that we're going the, the proportion of parallel to anti-parallel changes. The anti-parallel is in a high energy state and they return to a lower energy state. And the second part was the aspect of the hydrogen precession going from an in-phase situation to an out-of-phase random situation. So let's break those two parts apart and let's see how they help us to understand how we can enhance MRI images. Let's first concentrate on the anti-parallel going back to parallel. And that is often referred to as the spin flip. And we refer to this as T1 relaxation or T1 weighted. And I'll explain that in a moment. But in essence, the rate at which these anti-parallels go back to the parallel position depends on the actual tissue type. It isn't a constant rate. And the rate is determined by how much energy is lost in the surrounding tissue. So different tissue types have different relaxation rates when you're talking about the anti-parallel to parallel section. So here's a graph and we have two tissue types. And here we've got the signal. It's called the longitudinal magnetization recovery value. But in essence, it tells you the rate of relaxation that is going on in terms of the anti-parallel to parallel. Now, the fact is, is that because of the way fat is, it relaxes at a much greater rate. So this tissue type here, tissue A, is fat. So tissue type A, being fat, has a different rate of relaxation than tissue B, which in this case is water. And so the MRI machine is not only looking at the energy amount that it's receiving from any particular part of the body, but it also measures the rate at which those energy signals are changed. And it actually measures it at, at the value of 63%. So it measures a time, that's where the T1 and the T2 comes in, it measures the time at when that signal becomes 63%. And you can see that the value for fat is different to the value for water. You can see water takes a while to get to, to 63%, whereas fat is particularly quickly. As a result, is superimposed on our protein density image. So here is the same slice, but now what we have is a situation where we're saying it's T1 weighted. And as a result, being T1 weighted, you can see there's more contrast. And these areas that are appearing dark is actually the areas where there is a low density. So this is water or high in water value. This is, of course, clear also in this section over there. Of course, the cerebral spinal fluid. When you look the brain, the brain is a much lighter color. Well, it has higher density. And of course, it is a brighter color. And then if we look at the subcutaneous fat, which is predominantly fat, you can see it's whiter still. So we call this a T1 weighted image, and it is measuring the rate at which the spin lattice uh, recovers or relaxes. Now, this is really helpful. So in essence, what happens is, is that um, areas where there's high fat will appear white, area where there's uh, very low fat and water and empty space, at least or filled with fluid in terms of the brain, we have is dark. And that actually gives us greater definition, greater contrast in terms of the MRI. And that is really good for structure purposes. The fact that you got greater definition of the differences between fat and water and so forth, you can see this greater contrast. So that's T1 weighting. Let's now look at relaxation type 2. 
as I told you, there's a second aspect of relaxation, and that is when the hydrogen precession goes from an in-phase option, remember that's actually the important part of contributing why things get knocked down, to out of phase. So we have a gradual phase difference, and as a result, you're going to get it losing energy. But the rate at which tissue types relax in this aspect, which we often call to the spin-spin relaxation, is also varying depending on the tissue types. If we were to look at the graph, and we're not at this stage interested, if you're studying MRIs at university, this would be very important, but since this is a high school physics explained perspective, I'm not looking too much at the actual values here, but what we're seeing here is that the rate at which they go out of phase differs. Now you could measure the time at this value, but there's not a lot of difference here between the rates of these two tissue types. When we look at this value at a bit of load time, you can see there is a much greater difference between these two values. And so the greater difference that we have in this MXY decay, the more contrast you're going to get. So the question is, is what are these two tissue types? Well, the first is this lower, this changing from in phase to outer phase is quite quick when it comes to dense materials such as bone, but it is slower in terms of substances such as water. And so now you have a variation between the bone and water and obviously a whole bunch of different substances in between. And so what happens is that water appears bright as a result, but bone appears dark. Now, if you were listening about T1 weighting, it's the opposite. Water appears dark in that situation and bone also can appear dark, but it's water is important here in terms of bright. Now, why is that important? So here I have my protein density situation. I told you about that over here. And there's T1 weighting over here. And you can see these spaces here. These are called ventricles. They're mainly filled with cerebral spinal fluid. You can appear the dark. If you notice here with T2 weighting, the reverse is true. So in this case, you'll notice that the water areas are bright. So it's a clear example of T2 weighting. This is here not really clear with the proton density situation. It's certainly clearer here with the T1 weighting, but as long as you understand that the dark area is here is representative of water, representative of water. But in T2 weighting, you can see the reverse. Notice that the fat doesn't become really clear, but you've got this white over here, which is the fluid, and you sort of have almost a reverse image. Now, why is this useful? Well, T2 weighting is often used for functional reasons. So although in this case, we are looking at the brain where we don't see have much movement, where there is fluid movement, you'll find T2 weighting becomes really important because you can pick up the, what moves in terms of the fact that it's most likely to be a liquid, which means water in terms of the human situation. So that's T1 weighting and T2 weighting as opposed to the single proton density. So let's have a look at this image over here. Can you guess what type of weighting this image is? If you said T1 weighting, you are correct. And the clue here is the eyeballs and these ventricles. Notice the eyeballs here are practically empty. No, they're not. They're filled with a jelly-like substance, which we call vitreous humor. It is basically water. And so it appears dark. From my previous section, I talked to you about that the ventricles are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And so you can see it's dark. So this is all T1 weighted image. And what is really obvious, of course, is also the fat, which is clearly much brighter. You can see the fat over here in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, you can see the empty spaces, which is your airway, which you'd expect to be dark. All of these here are representative of T1 weighting. If we look at this image, you'll notice that this is markedly different. And in this case, what we have 
are these white areas? Well, it's pretty obvious what they are. So what we have here is the aorta. We have a number of branches of arteries and, and veins, but arteries are the predominant one because they are filled with blood. And blood, of course, is 55% plasma, which is predominantly water. So this is really good functional information. So this MRI would be much better to determine, for example, blockages in the arteries, because what happens is you'd see occlusions or uh, blockages in these arteries where um, there obviously isn't much blood going through. So you can see that is a very good use for functional information. So this is a T2 type of weighting type of image. So that summarizes T1 weighting, T2 weighting, and proton density as well. In my last video, my next video, I asked the question, how does the MRI know where the signal is coming from? And that's referred to as localization. And in that video, I'll talk to you about how the MRI works out the actual location of a signal. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question, or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.